The plains of East Africa's remote areas often simmer under a brutal solar glare, creating the illusion of water. But one man decided to turn this illusion into reality using windmills. This is a story told through the lens of the pioneer visionary and founder of Kijito Wind Power Limited, Mike Harris. Wow, this is, this is not something that I expected to see. This is a bit like seeing your daughter be violated, really. I mean, th this machine was put here in 2004 for this girls' school, funded by the Ministry of Energy, two million shillings worth. The sad thing is that the, 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 the bits of the windmill that have just been thrown here in the bush, there was nothing wrong with, with those. The problem was always down the borehole. Right at the beginning, when we put this windmill here in 2004, we went to the authorities and we said, look, we, we make this machine, we can maintain this machine, and just and for the first year we visited it a couple of times and, and, and everything was okay. Now we come back sometime later and we find the whole machine has just been cut up in pieces and thrown into the bush. Two million shillings worth of our taxpayers' money. It's just been thrown in. There's nothing wrong with any of this equipment here. This is, it was the down, down the borehole things that were the problem. And the sad thing is that the headmistress told us that she had to now go and connect with, with mains power, with a submersible using mains power, which is very expensive, costing you more than 20,000 shillings a month, okay? The sad thing is that the windmill could have actually stayed exactly where it was and they could have put the submersible down without removing the windmill. So, but they just come, cut it to pieces and throw it in the bush like a lot of rubbish. I mean, th this, is, this is heartbreaking. It really is heartbreaking. In the institution, the borehole uh, provided water for the use in the school kitchen, for use in the fish pods, and also for the growing of the vegetables. Uh, outside there in the community, the school was able to sell water to the community and it really assisted the community. Since the borehole broke down a few years ago, uh, we no longer have fish in this com compound. Uh, the vegetables, they are a little a problem and the girls are really struggling with the water. So we would appeal to the Kisito group to revive the borehole for us so that we can be comfortable and we can continue with uh, what we were doing, our project, the fees with the vegetables and the like. See, like a two area. Tulikuwa na shida. Kwa mana tulikuwa tumesoea hii maji ya hii pambu. Ni mzuri kwa kupika chai, kwa kuoga, haina chumbi. Sasa vile ili haribiga, situliluti kwa, kwa muto. Na muto kutoka hapa kwetu, he ni kilomita kama mbili. Ukitembea uende maji. Madhala ile imepatikana. Sasa hizo miti tulikuwa tumepanda na mboka, sinili silikauka, tukaishiwa na mboka. Sasa mboka ni katutu, ni kilioko, ni kabati. Hata wale wako na tuosti huku, wanaendea tu huko. Na zamani walikuwa na kujia tu hapa, karibu. Sasa shida yenyewe ni ukame ni umengia. Na tulikuwa tumetoka kwa ukame. The quest to provide water for hundreds of communities living in remote parts of Kenya and neighboring countries often seems to be an uphill trek through slick mud. And for Mike Harris, the journey from where he began to where he is now is quite a story. It all started in the 70s when Mike volunteered to fly eye surgeons all over remote parts of Kenya and Tanzania to help restore sight for people who had been blind or partially blind as a result of a fly-borne disease called trachoma. The main reason I got involved with wind, wind power was when I found that children were going blind through trachoma because they couldn't wash their faces. So that's what got me initially involved in, in, in working in the desert trying to provide water. Inspired by subsequent success stories, 
gathered during his annual trips with eye surgeons, Mike envisioned a windmill that could lift water from deep within the dry plains of northern and eastern Kenya through the Intermediate Technology Development Group in Brisbane and the funding of up to £250,000 from the British government, Mike built both his skill and business acumen, eventually forming Kijito Wind Power Limited to execute a vision that has seen hundreds of desert families continue to enjoy clean running water many decades later. In Swahili, Kijito, K-I-J-I-T-O, is a small stream of water. And so straight away I thought, that, that's the answer. It incorporates my African background, it's Swahili, uh, it mentions something about water, but it acknowledges the part that intermediate technology played in that early part of the British assistance to us that enabled us to make the windmill that we're making today. Kijito is an iconic name because you, you'll find a lot of windmills in places that you don't expect, in the middle of the bush. For example, in Savo, in the northern Kenya, in a place like this. The British aid made it possible technically, but of course we had to do all the flying, we had to do all the building, the bringing things back, checking, remaking, taking them back. Uh, but, but we did it and we ended up uh, after about seven years with, with a credible machine that if looked after with a little bit of greasing twice a year would last 25 or 30 years. It took six or seven years for us to have a machine that actually could start pumping water for a long period of time from deep depths. And of course all the extra work we did we had to do at our own expense. Once the guy has bought a windmill you can't keep telling him to pay more because you're developing it. Mike's early struggles were due to the fact that his academic background is in agriculture. This, however, did not deter him because he had gathered necessary skills as a bush mechanic running a Kenyan farm. All the initial designs were basically on the back of an envelope and so he had to teach himself how to use a card drawing program to develop all the bits of the windmill. The fuel crisis in the 1970s led to the investigation of an alternative energy not dependent on fossil fuels. At approximately the same time, Mike Harris was experimenting with wind power. This was our first prototype and we put up something a bit like this on Olpegeta Ranch in 1979 and it didn't last very long. It just wasn't strong enough to, to pump water from, from great depths. So then we had to come and, and work through a whole series of months and years of development work going from this basic machine to this one. This is now, we'll end up with that one over there, this is now about a seven year program going from this basic machine made in 79 to this machine over here that we made in about uh, 1985. And this, this is the machine that we're making today. This only weighs about 350 kilos. It's an awful lot lighter than that one you saw there. And this is, this is how it works. This is the rotor that is turned by the blades and we'll be having a look at the blades in, in a minute. So this is the rotor. So I'm simulating the wind. So when I turn this, you see what happens? You then get this up and down movement at the back here. And that is connected by pump rods to the pump cylinder which is deep down in the borehole. So that up and down action is what actually pumps the water. So every time it goes up, it lifts water. Every time it goes down, it picks up water and lifts it again on the upstroke. So that's how the whole technology works. So let's go over there and we'll see the different blade sizes that we make. This now helps you to get some idea of the different sizes of windmills that we make. Obviously the power that a windmill can generate depends on the size of the blades. Obviously the smaller the blade, that's a 12 foot, so that, that's, that's a 6 foot, so twice that's 12 foot rotor, 16 foot rotor, 20 foot rotor, 24 foot rotor and 26 foot rotor. So as we go up, obviously the power that's available from that bigger rotor helps you pump from greater depths or, or lift the water and push it greater distances. So the whole 
aspect of, of how much a windmill can uh, power it can produce depends on the rotor size. And here we have the uh, five sizes, uh, one, two, three, four, five sizes of windmills that we make. And as I said earlier, the design of these blades was done by the Westlands Helicopter Company in Britain. There's a, a, a twist here. May not be difficult to see, but there's a twist in this blade, which makes it aerodynamically unique in terms of wind pump design. Mike was indeed an early prophet of wind power in Kenya, believing that building windmills to lift water from boreholes, dugouts, and rivers could be done profitably. And yet, the process of Kijito Wind Power Limited has often seemed painfully slow. From 1980 to 2012 or 13, we actually installed nearly 500 machines in East Africa and beyond. We also exported a few machines to, to other countries, but obviously the bulk of our machines were in East Africa, okay? Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda. Um, and so, but then things started to, business started to slow down. There was a time when we were making 20, 30 machines a year, uh, but then business started to, to, to decline. And one of the reasons was that solar was becoming more uh, economically viable for, for farmers to use. But then I, we have to say that um, we didn't get a lot of encouragement or assistance from, from our own uh, government. Kijito Power has been able to come up with the ideas. They have sat down, they have done the sketches, they have come up with the small concepts that can work. The question is now, how do you bring this to market? You need government to come in, you need people who are in industry, who have resources to come in, so that you can be able to bridge that now from small scale to large scale. And that's crucial. If that is going to work, if for Kijito to work, that will be uh, something that is necessary. Yes, businesses like uh, Kijito Power, have a role to play in uh, enhancing the use of renewable energy and also increasing the, the livelihood of, of people. For example, then if we are able to deploy Kijito windmills in an area where they are using diesel power, then you are able to save because in the long run, there are no operating costs of buying the fuel. And then again, it is, a, it is very clean uh, clean power. And we encourage such innovations so that they can be able to have a foothold in, uh, in, in economic empowerment of our people. But as I said, the whole reason that we started Kijito was to help people get water in remote areas. We here are privileged, we turn on a tap and the water comes out. Okay? In Turkana, some of the people are walking 12, 15 kilometers to get water. And we thought, these people need, need some help. And that's with another reason behind the whole concept of Kijito. It has been found that more than half of the world's rural population does not have access to clean water supply, mainly due to the limited availability of power supply that can be used to supply water from the source to a point of consumption. This provides a greater opportunity for Kijito to thrive despite existing challenges. Initially, most of our people that were buying windmills were NGOs, okay? Um, some of them overseas NG NGOs, people like World Vision, um, people like USAID, people like uh, ODA, people like GTZ, they bought a lot of our machines initially as the technology was developing. But then we started getting involved with ranchers, as with old Pegeta, uh, and then we started getting involved with, with small holders, because we make a, a, quite a small machine that is adequate for a, a small holder who's got a, a small well and just wants some water for two or three cows and some vegetables that, he, that mama can grow for, for the house. Um, and so we actually developed a much more indigenous customer base. First and foremost, we were looking for a medium yield uh, bohon. So we were not really interested in a lot of water uh, per hour, uh, just for the needs of our, our livestock farm. And uh, we realized that we would not be using any diesel. Uh, secondly, areas that we visited that had windmills, the windmills have been going for decades and decades and the maintenance costs were, were minimal. Uh, compared to our 
uh, generator ball, which we, you know, we have to fix every year, and it costs a lot of money. Mr. Michael Mbithi is one of Mike's loyal customers. His family bought its Gajit windmill over 30 years ago and still relies on it to date. The windmill is placed in a scenic landscape of Konza in Machakos County, Kenya. I got to know Mike Harris uh, in 1995 when you're looking for a water solution and they came and installed uh, this windmill behind us. Uh, basically, we looked around for a cost-effective uh, 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 alternative energy uh, uh, solution and this was the first uh, solution that we were given, the best solution we were given. The swim pump has been uh, standing there for the last 23 years, actually 24 years. And in that time, uh, on average, we have been watering about uh, 1,200 cattle per day. Uh, this, we have two running bowls at any one time. This has always been running. And uh, apart from the 1,200 cattle, uh, we also water about an approximate number of about 3,000 head of game. So there's, for example, right now in the dry season, uh, when the, the dams are dry, our, our water needs are fed. Uh, both our domestic water feeds and the livestock water feeds and wildlife are fed by this windmill and one other generator. You do not have to run uh, uh, putting diesel and looking for diesel every moment. And uh, it just pumps day and night. Uh, it, it doesn't use the sun, it uses the wind. The wind is there day and night. So you, it's, it's a great joy when you go to your tank and it's full and uh, you are not there to pump or anything. And uh, you know, to a point even that some of the excess water we use for irrigating uh, our, our vegetable patches. So it's a, it's a very good installation. Kijito Wind Power Limited is primarily a family business, but together with the employees, who have been part of the company for more than two decades. It is one big family, guided by uncompromising integrity and the desire to serve humanity. I've always been the, the, the chairman and, and founder, okay? My daughter, uh, when she came from college in uh, 1981, 82, uh, the, the plan was, and this has been a family joke, the plan was that she would just come and help her old man get this thing off on the road. Uh, and she never left. <laughs> and so she's been working with us right from the very beginning. So she's, she was the financial director. For a while, her husband, uh, Julian, was also part of, of the financial accounting side. But then when things got a bit tough financially, and the company wasn't able to, to uh, be able to support all the family. He had to go back to his first love, which was school teaching, and he's worked at Pony School for nearly the last 20 years. The company values of Kijito are to try and run a company on ethical principles. Okay? We do not bribe. We have never bribed a single person for anything in the history of the company. And I don't believe my father ever did before he died in 1970. So that has been part of, 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 of our foundational beliefs, that we have to run an ethical business. Then the second thing was to try and, where possible, employ as many handicapped, challenged people, physically challenged people. because. The whole concept of sight by wings was dealing with blind people. I said, well, it's no good just healing them. We've got to give them a job. And I think as you, as you talk to some of our employees, you'll, you'll see that they've got the vision, that we're not here just to make money. We, we would like to make money, of course, and pay back the, the incredible amount of money that we put in the research and development. But also we're here for a, a service. We're here to try and help people. Uh, who are not privileged to be able to turn a tap on and get water. The most impressive value that uh, you know, I, I value about Kijito is uh, the fact that they are dedicated to professionalism and quality first. Uh, they know that water is not an issue of uh, waiting. Usually when a, a pump breaks down, uh, it's just a matter of days before the entire dam dries, uh, the, the, the entire ranch dries up. And water is a very valuable aspect of running a ranch. So the most important thing is that they come to the rescue. 
uh, no questions asked as soon as possible. They'll even arrive here at night and make sure that the work is done very fast, very efficiently, professionally and with quality. We have not had to go back and say, you have given us bad parts or it's not working. Whenever they do a job, that windmill runs, you know, for two years without needing any service. Secondly, uh, Kijito Value Conservation. So we have been able to discuss with them. For example, when repairs and, and work is expensive, they've been able to give us discounts on the value that we are a conservancy and that they support conservation. Some of the people that Mike employed at the beginning had O-level certificates, but he trained them on the job. And now they are skilled workers from a mechanical point of view. But it's been a gradual process of bringing these guys, some, as I said, just form four levers, to being very skilled artisans. And it does need a special sort of person, as you saw when we went down to, to uh, Mr. Mbidi's farm. You're, you're, you're dealing at uh, doing something at 30, 40 feet above the ground, and you've got to be comfortable up there. And, and some of the guys initially were not very comfortable, but very soon were able to cope with that adequately and safely. Mwanzo, nimefaidika kwa ajili ya wakati na potumwa, kupeleka kijito kwa site ni sehemu mingi sana ambayo nimeshajua coast province system wapi wapi nimeshatembea kule mike cha kwanza yeye ni tajiri ambaye ameajiri watu katika kampuni hii ambayo jina lake aliweka kijito yani ka stream kidogo kama maji na pia kutoka hapo ina faidi sana watu kwa upande wa maji na mambo kama hayo nimefaidika na mambo mingi kwa sababu acha nimenunua shaba nimesomesha watoto mpaka wa Kaida University tena nimeogesha ujuzi ya kuwa foreman ya kuangalia watu sasa ujuzi wangu sasa imekuwa mingi sasa kwa sababu naweza fanya na watu wengi kwa nikija hapa nilikuwa sio foreman nilikuwa nimekuja kama machinist sasa hiyo nikaja nikipata gazi kutoka machinist mpaka senior foreman eh nimefaitika sana na ujuzi wa upande wa engineering kutokana na mambo ya stima kutengeneza fridge, microwave kama washing machine, eh, rewiring za motors, vitu mingi zile zinaozikana na stima hata mambo ya solar. Na mimi najua kabisa nikitoka hapa sitasumbuka. Itakuwa na faida nyumbani kwa. Nimefaidika na kazi hapa kijito kwa sababu nilikuja kama masonari na nimeongezea ujuzi nikawa migwelda kwa kuchoma chuma na na na, na, na gasi natumia CO2 kwa hivyo nimefaidika sana kusema ukweli ujuzi nimepata ujuzi kama nne ama tano kwanza nilikuja kama sijajua vizuri welding sasa nimekuwa kama mwalimu wa kuchoma haya pili habari ya gas welding nimejifunzia hapa hata habari ya brazing ya tatu nimepata hii habari ya profile cutting ujuzi ya kuchanganya gazi mbili alafu zinakata moto zinakata chuma yenyewe nimepata ujuzi ya mambo mingi kwa sababu nilikuja hapa nikiwa arc welder na nikaweza kujua mambo ya gas welding pia na hata hiyo ya mig na nimepata ujuzi ambaye naweza fanya mambo mingi ama naweza fanya kazi nyingi katika hali ya ujenzi wa taifa. Kwa hivyo nimepata experience ya mambo mingi hapa. Good morning sir. Hello Beth. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You were away yesterday. What were you up to? I understand you had a day off yesterday. Yes, I went to a funeral. Oh, okay. Yes. Pole. Okay, dog. Uh this this is Beth. Uh, and I want to tell you her story. She just brought me a lovely cup of tea. 29 years ago, this young lady was our tea maker in the office, and she made quite good tea. So then we needed someone to help the person that was running the telephone. So she became the assistant telephone operator. And she did that quite well, and she took over the switchboard. And then sometimes later, we needed someone to help with the accounts. And finally, the guy that used to help us with the accounts retired. So now Beth has been promoted from tea lady to helping us run the accounts of this company. And she's been with us for these 29 years and she's been very faithful and she still makes a very good cup of tea. Thanks so much, Beth. You have a good day. Thank, Thank you. you.
In an economy burdened by the high cost of fossil fuels and a planet already feeling the impact of climate change, the quest for renewable energy becomes ever more urgent and yet, in some parts of Eastern Africa, there are myths about wind energy that need to be dispelled while increasing awareness about its benefits. Some of the myths that exist uh, in, in, in regards to windmill is that uh, uh, there is a confusion that the same effect large uh, energy generating turbines have on birds and wildlife is the same effect that a windmill has. Uh, this windmill in, in comparison to a turbine is very small and it only moves whenever the wind uh, blows and it does not have uh, generators or, or dynamos within it. It's just mechanical, pushing water up and down. So I have not seen any, any issue. We've had birds nesting on, on the structure. We've had bees. I think all those are very sensitive animals. We have animals using this water right here and they come and hang around. So I don't think there's any uh, negative effect from the windmill. There is one time we were doing a wind project somewhere near Nairobi and then there were concerns that it will bring health problems to the people around. We were told that it is going to cause women not to get children, it will cause cows not to be able to give enough milk. And so there were some myths about um, the wind energy generally affecting the health of the people, of animals, and, uh, and, and those are just myths, it's not uh, true really. And it's difficult, you know, without education to convince people, you know, they don't understand how rotating turbines create energy. But I would like to say uh, to uh, assuage all people, whether it be a solar power panel or um, a wind turbine, uh, there is nothing in the air uh, that, is, uh, that anybody should be afraid of. Everything happens within the technology systems, within the wind turbine system, within the photovoltaic cell, okay, which acts as a generator of energy and then transmits uh, to the wiring, uh, whether it be you know, a home solar solution through the wiring in the household or whether it is be to the national grid, um, there is nothing to be afraid of. One of the aspects that we face during our development is that people, some people, uh, saw this as a discarded technology, that this was no longer relevant to, to uh, power supplies in, 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 in the 21st century. Okay? This is something that, that was phased out years and years ago. So that, that's part of the myth that we face. That this, is, this is no longer relevant. But as I've said, the advantage of it is that it can be made in Kenya by Kenyans. Okay? So to me, the technology is still very, very viable. Looking at uh, the importance of wind energy in Kenya, there is a need for concerted effort to be able to increase the awareness of benefits of wind as a clean form of energy it's available, so it needs to be able to be used. This ideally will call for concerted effort of all the wind practitioners, and, but most also on the government. I think a lot is going on in universities and technical colleges around Kenya to start to look at wind and other technologies. There's a lot of courses going on, there's a lot of things going on at the grassroots to try to educate. And of course there's also an opportunity for employment, for young people to get involved in this. We have been desperate and we have not really succeeded in trying to develop um, the youth of an area to get involved with us in looking after the machines that are used by their community. Documentaries such as this, um, uh, highlighting and showcasing projects such as Mike Harris's uh, uh, Kijito project is very, very important because I think that the more people get to know, small or big, whether it be Kijito or, the, or, 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 or Electrocana, uh, wind power, that this is a way to go into the future where we actually are able to enjoy energy from the earth, from Mother Nature, without destroying Mother Nature. Harvesting wind power isn't exactly a new idea. The earliest known uses dates as far back as the 12th century when the first windmills were built in Europe for grinding grains into flour. The type of technology associated with windmill water pumps has enjoyed continuous use since the late 19th century America where windmills were used for pumping water into farms. Today, 
the old-fashioned windmill is still being built and used by farmers in developed countries in America and Australia. Electrical energy is not the only useful form of energy. You also have mechanical energy. So for example, in pumps, the wind, the, you still have your rotary motion and now the mechanical energy is transmitted through a system of links or gears, whatever you need, and is connected to a pump and the pump is also using mechanical energy. So based, depending on what type of pump it is, you, you configure your transmission systems to suit the pump and you're able to, to pump water. The kinetic energy of the wind in this case is cheaper to produce. However, over 80% of the total energy consumed by humans is derived from fossil fuels, leading to environmental concerns and climate change because of the indirect greenhouse gas emissions. Everything we use from airplanes, refrigerators, um, the way we do things, uh, just using electricity, you know, and the source of electricity, because some of them are fuel driven, means that we must now stop and say, what impact are we having on our planet? And what will our children, grandchildren, or what will posterity find on planet Earth? And because of that, that discussion on more renewable forms of energy uh, becomes very, very important. Many people feel that if we do not start reducing our carbon emissions quite soon, we're, we're going to get to a very serious, perhaps not quite irreversible, but getting to a very serious position. So almost every day now we're reading about initiatives to try and increase renewable energy around the world. And it's, it's getting worse because of this uh, global warming effect, right? So basically the less we can control the weather, the less we can control our sources of energy. And this is not going to be beneficial for us because then that means we cannot rely on renewable energies in the future. So we really have to stop this global warming in terms for us to be able to really rely on renewable sources. In Kenya has uh, put some strides in the development of renewable energy. Currently our electricity subsector 90% of it we get from renewable energy, mainly hydropower, geothermal, and right now wind energy is coming in. The share of wind energy right now is about 13%, which is significant uh, because a few years ago we only had Gong Wind, which was producing 5 megawatts, it has now increased to 25 megawatts, and now we have Lake Turkana, which is 310. It's giving us a lot of uh, energy generated to the national grid. In the case of Kijito, the only emissions that the windmills produce are indirect, meaning that those that result from manufacturing parts, installation and maintenance, but even those are minimal. Harnessing power from these windmills would help combat climate change and save a lot on power costs that are continuously on the rise. OK, let's take a little bit of a walk around our facility. Our guys are off to lunch right now, so it's all quite quiet. But just to show you how, how the layout is here. And of course, this has been built over, over a number of years. This is our paint shop, OK, where we spray all the blades and all the other aspects. So this is where all the spraying happens right here. OK, and uh, all the paints and things are kept in that store at the back there. So this is where all the, the, the spraying is done. And then this, um, this large room here is where we do the assembly and the fabrication and this is where the bulk of the machine is made. We will go to the machine shop in a minute and that's where all the expensive equipment that we've had to buy but this this is our, our general assembly and fabrication. Uh, this this machine here is um, some rollers. This, this rolls the blades to give them a little bit of a curve so the blades have to have a slight curve in them so that it goes through here and that, that rolls the, a bit of a curve into the blades here. Here we have uh, blades waiting um, to go through the different processes. So here we have the, the blade spars here uh, and other aspects of different things that, are, that, that have been fabricated. Here, this is where a lot of the, the fabrication happens here.
when we put up a windmill, the foundations obviously have to be cast before we, we come and, and stand our tower up. So these, these are the, the foundation templates. So this is like the base of our windmill. So we use this to cast the concrete foundations. This is like the bottom tower of our windmill. So that it's a foundation template. So the guys can go out and, and, and make the foundations before we even come in with a windmill. So when they come in with a windmill, the foundations are exactly right because they're made with this template. Here are all the jigs for making the different blades. The blades have a special curve, which was designed by the Westlands helicopter business. The, we got an awful lot of help from the British government in the early 1980s with technical backup, and part of it was the design of these blades. And each blade has its own uh, chassis here, which gives it the exact curve that we need for, for the finished product. But the actual twist of this blade was, was supplied to us by Westlands helicopters as part of that help from the British government. This is quite a unique piece of equipment, and this we came up with right at the very beginning. We had a, a, a missionary who was an engineer called Steve Wilson, and he helped us at the very beginning. And this is the jig for making the towers, and it rotates, so it's easy for the guy to be able to move it around, and it can actually make all the four different sections of our tower in, one, in, in this one jig, because the top section goes from here to there, the next section goes from there to there, as you see here, the next one goes from there to there, and then the bottom one goes from there to there. So we can actually make a 40-foot windmill tower on this jig. And, and we've now made, installed nearly 500 kijitas. So this has made nearly 2,000 bits of towers here uh, over the years. So um, that, that's, that's pretty unique and, it, and it's, it served us very well. Again, very, very old equipment, but uh, you've seen it operating and this is our flame cut shop where we can cut all the, the different sizes. I mean, that, that very heavy piece of steel will be made into a crank uh, at one stage, but you can see the thickness that it cuts, okay? This machine, that will become one of our cranks, one of our big machines when it's machined out, and it's cut by this machine here. And then this will just be a, 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 the bottom of a tower plate, ready to be drilled to, to make the bottom to, to, to join one tower section to another. So again, each cut to an exact shape. So this is our flame cut shop. So now this is, this is our assembly, but also the back is our machine shop. So this is where the actual, once we've made all the pieces, the machine comes in here and it's assembled on this table. You see all the various components around, they come and bolt it all together. So this is where the actual transmission is assembled. As we enter the machine shop, here is actually where the tea is made for the morning and afternoon tea. This used to be the workshop manager's office way back in those days, but it's now, now where the tea is made. Now this is where the real heart of, the, of our fabrication unit is, and this is our machine shop. We have uh, three, three different lathes here. This, this is the, the more modern one, although it's nearly 40 years old. This is a Colchester lathe. I don't know what it would cost today, but it, I think it would cost an awful lot of money. This has been the heart of the machine. And as you saw, Karyuki, our senior foreman, has just done... S what he can do with this machine, you can't believe. He is so skilled. He's done the most incredible work over all those years with this machine. This machine on the left here, this machine is over 100 years old. This lathe here, it's over 100 years old. I bought it off the scrap in the, in, the, in the industrial area in Nairobi way back in the early 1980s. And we had a problem with one of the gears here. So I contacted the manufacturer of this machine back in the UK and they said, sorry, we, we, we don't have spares for machines that are 100 years old. But anyway, we, we never actually had to change the gear. It's just incredible. This thing is made like a tank and it's done a lot of our rough work over the years. And then over here, there's a very small lathe. This is very, very old, but this is, this is a little bit history because uh, when my dad, when I was a child, and my dad had this in his workshop up near the house, and I used to, when I was just a little kid, I used to watch my dad using this machine way back, you know, in the 1940s and 1950s when I was a kid, and now we're able to use it here in the workshop, and it has been in, working in this workshop ever since we started the uh, Kijito work. And then let's just move to the store here.
This is uh, the store run by Joseph Motokar. He's been with us right from the very beginning. He held sway here. Of course, he's off having his lunch break. But the interesting thing about this store here is because we make 90% of the windmill, we don't have to keep any spare parts. So here, he just keeps the tins of paint and the bearings and the nuts and the bolts because everything else we make. So the actual store here doesn't actually carry an awful lot of stuff because we, we make everything. So if suddenly somebody wants a spare, we can, we can make it in just a few days. So we don't actually have to keep a huge stock of spares here. He also doubles as the first aid guy. He's gone through some training. So he's licensed to, to run the first aid. So if people have cuts or bruises or whatever, tummy aches, whatever, he, they, he comes here and he, he uh, is licensed to, to help them with their, with their complaints. And he has his little medical kit here as well. So he's, he's a multi-purpose guy. As we complete our brief tour of the workshop, the guys are back from lunch now, so there's a bit of activity again. This is where I believe the future of Kijito development lies, in being able to use our dense, slow-turning rotor to turn a generator. We're still competitive where we're pumping water from, from, from like, a, like a dam or a lake or something. Yes, because the pumping system is, 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 is right there. But where we're pumping from deep water, deep boreholes, as I've said, that's where we become uncompetitive. I believe this can change the whole arithmetic. Because once we can generate electricity, we can use those same components that the solar people use. The same plastic pipes, the same electric cable, the same uh, submersible pumps that are made by the thousand. So that's where I believe, by being able to generate electricity in low wind speeds, I believe that we can change the whole future of multi-blade windmill design. The quest to develop an alternative source of energy against the power of fossil fuel driven industry, as Mike realized, was no task for the faint-hearted. It has been two steps forward and one step back for him. For close to four decades, Mike's struggles have been chiefly characterized by politics at the local and national levels in some places, and negotiating a complex web of government bureaucracy and corruption across the paths of Kijito projects. The impact of competing alternative sources of energy, particularly solar, cannot be ignored either. We are no longer as competitive to solar as we used to be and that now we have to change track and come to a new business model. Kujito's micro windmills, together probably with solar, uh, could make a real difference in terms of developing those rural areas and communities. Um, the good thing about windmills is, even at night when there is no sunlight, wind very often is still operating. So that's a big advantage in terms of uh, micro windmills versus solar. Um, ideal, you would uh, basically use the two things together. I've had discussions about uh, having windmills that serve a dual purpose, pump water and generate energy, or some that actually just uh, produce energy and the energy is also used to pump water, uh, also and also uh, um, uh, 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 provide consumption power for, for homesteads. Now, I know there's uh, a lot of new technology on wind turbines and smaller wind turbines as such, uh, and I think it's just a matter of time uh, before somebody can modify one to be able to last in the African bush because everything needs some Africanization. It's a, it's a tough environment. Uh, but uh, I'm hoping the technology will get to the point where we can use it in uh, areas like this because solar is not enough in itself. Viability of windmills is however practical only in areas with free flow of air and therefore site selection is crucial in the initial design process. The power generated from the windmill can be supplied to off-grid areas as a mini-grid. We are looking at the off-grid off areas to electrify with the solar and wind and other decentralized systems. We think then if, if Kijito was to also use the same technology they are using for water lifting and be able to innovate even small wind turbines for, electric, for electrical power generation for energy needs of, uh, of the citizens, that would be very good. And that calls for uh, collaboration with our research institutions, educational institutions, 
so that we can be able to innovate and bring uh, current uh, technologies into their model of uh, technology. A mini grid is basically an isolated grid not connected to the main grid that serves a smaller uh, section of the country or the community, depending on what you want to call it. So for that, for these um, sections, wind would be applicable uh, to generate electricity to serve these people. And so and if you're looking at smaller power generation companies, then they would be able to serve such sections of the community very well. And um, just depending on, of course, the costs that they're using to serve the community, because of course you'd also find that the people who are living in these areas tend to be uh, of lower income, so they have less money to spend. Lack of community participation is another challenge that has impeded progress for Kijito in the long run. First of all, the, the, the people that are getting the water need to have a sense of ownership. And if they don't have a sense of ownership, then that does make it very difficult. But we also feel that we have a responsibility to try and, wherever possible, keep our machines going, even if we have to go the extra mile. But of course, financially, that does become a bit of a... When you've got 350 machines listed all over Kenya, we can't visit every single machine and hold people's hands and say, look, uh, you need this or you need that. We have to wait for people to call us. Um, uh, and then we will we'll go and deal with it. So that's also been uh, a part, part of the struggle. I see how important it is to uh, get the community together, to really see what are the needs, what are the ideas that the community has, and to develop that further with uh, technical expertise, with uh, um, different stakeholders that can support any initiative that are coming from the community. Um, listening to Mike Harry's story and uh, the current situation of Kijito, we understood that um, what he sees uh, in this moment to, that needs to be addressed is the maintenance on the, of the windmills and that um, what, he, what is the reality now is that the community in which the windmill were brought and installed um, doesn't have a real ownership. Uh, there is not a caring from the community. Kwenye wangu naona, ikiwa itatengenezwa, tuicho kwa barasa, tuelezwe vile tunawenza itumia, vile tunawenza itunza, tuambiwa mukifanya i mtaribu, mukifanya i mtakuwa mmetunza kwa mana ni yenu ina wafaidi. Sasa naona mkutano, utakuwa muhimu sana. Kwa vazili ni ningesema waendelee tu kama wanaweza kuona mashini ingine iko na nguvu kushinda hii watu ongezee. Ndiyo sasa sababu hii wakati tunangoja kiangazi na kiangazi kikuja hapa kama ungekuja mwezi wa tisa ndiyo ungejua maneno mzuri. Ungepata hapa watu ni wengi na maji ni kidogo. Yes maji chini ni mingi lakini kwa ile kutoka kwa ile voz ndiyo watosheke inakuwa iko iko low. Sasa mimi ningesema kama kuna pat, kuna zapatikana chombo kingine cha kutoa maji kwa wingi ingekuwa tumesaidika pakubwa. Naweza kuwashauri wa tuongezee nini maalipa kama hiyo ya kutengeneza eh, moto wachange simu ama waone television waongezee tu watu ongezee mashini nyingine. Kwa upande wangu naweza kuambia wakifanya ifo watakuwa wametusaidia sana kwa vile tumesumbuka kwanza tupate maji karibu alafu tupate hata kama inaweza tengeneza moto tukuwe na moto kwa nyumba si tutategemea tu ya mkopa sasa unajua ya mkopa kabla hujaweka mia siku hiyo upati moto <laughs> upati mwangaza tv inakuwa matoto hata angalia hii mashini ya kijito huwa inatusaidia kwa sababu huwa pale sehemu zingine ziko mbali Wacha hapa karibu watu huwa wanakuja kuchota maji hapa. Wao inaokoa wana wana, wana ile, tuseme kama hii location mzima huwa wanakuja hapa. Wanachota maji na wanaenda makwao. Isipokuwa huwa wanatoka mbali. Lakini mtu si amesaidika sababu amepata maji. Kama inge kuwepo, ingekuwa ni shida tupu. Eneo hii ama watu wa elia hii wanashukuru sana watu wa Kenjito ama kambuni hii ya Kenjito sababu wakati Kenjito walikuja walikuja hii helia walisaidia hao watu sana 
na wanashukuru sana wanasema ni asanti sababu hakuna hakuna manje elia hii ya kampuni nyingine isipokuwa hii ya kizito last but even more significant is the lack of funding to further develop Mike's designs which require rigorous approach for optimum application you, you know when you look at uh, what kijito is doing uh, this is a case where the initial cost is, is very high but then uh, the other running cost are low which means if communities are then to get access to this technology they will need to match a lot of uh, resources in the in the initial but then after that you don't need to buy well because it is uh, you are using a natural resource uh, and you find that uh, financing uh, is, is, is quite expensive in Kenya unable to overcome corruption at county and national levels mike has been forced to sell off parts of his property to continue funding kijito meaning that some of his long term projects have not made it to the finish line kijito actually amongst our family it, it's 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 a bit strange because we are very proud in a sense of what we've accomplished but it has been a very huge drain on on the family resources and so there's that a bit of enigma we we be, we believe that we have done a fantastic job with the help of very many people but it has also been uh, quite a, a financial burden for us to keep it going because we were determined that it would not fail but things have been tough we've even had to sell part of the farm to to keep it going so that there's been a price as a family to pay for our commitment to this project but we believe that there's still light at the end of the tunnel we believe that if we can really find some some people with the technology and the skills that i personally do not possess in terms of trying to to move forward on this this whole aspect of generating electricity with a slow turning route, rotor using gearboxes and belt drives I believe if we can find so, some partnership with the skills and the expertise that we lack I believe that that idea can be developed and can bring bless we we have brought water to hundreds of thousands of people in arid areas of East Africa and beyond that's been such a privilege to see kids and animals and even elephants getting water but the next step is to give them electricity from what I saw in Kijito they have done it in small scale and in Kenya one of the biggest problems you always have is to bring something from um, the inception to market so some guys have wonderful ideas and they start them small and they generate the ideas and they test them and they are working and all that but bringing that to market becomes the difficult part now bridging the idea like what they have in Kijito from just the concept of generating wind to electricity to actually having a windmill that is producing electricity needs resources so and needs um uh, research it needs a uh, big labs it needs a lot of it needs input kijito closes down we will see that uh, provision of water in some of those areas is going to be problematic uh, the women and young girls are going to go to to the rivers to fetch water uh, and and that to then mean that uh, active time is is lost and therefore kijito should not and must not close down because they have a part to play in the development of the country in development of wind energy in the country despite all the economic and political hurdles mike has never lost track of his vision and some of his early experiences are a source of inspiration reminding him to soldier on the other one i remember was a windmill north of isiolo and uh, um i was there passing by and i had my camera and there was a um <clears throat> a guy bringing some sheep and goats to to water at the trough and i i started taking pictures it's a lovely picture in fact i've got it in my house even today a lovely picture and uh, so um i'm taking the pictures and this very irate shepherd comes up and says why are you taking pictures of my of my animals because they 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 feel that sometimes you may be uh, harming something by taking pictures and and he got quite irate and i said look just just cool it friend this machine was put in by my family and my company and he went wow 
And he said, you see all these young calves and stuff here that are watering? I said, yes. He said, those are mine and they are alive because of the water in that trough. And then he said, the other day I came to water my, my sheep and my goats and my cows and a whole bunch of elephants came in, chased my cows away, and they started drinking the water. So he said, even the elephants are thanking God for you. So that again, you know, in the midst of all the ups and downs, you get these little anecdotes which encourage you the way you're actually helping and making life easier for those people out in the deserts of Kenya. Indeed, Mike's work is inspirational. It is an example of what an enlightened vision coupled with tenacity could do but to move forward, there is need for concerted effort by stakeholders and the government of Kenya in terms of technical support and policy formulation to cascade the use of wind power in off-grid zones. Digital needs to automate so that you can be able to have a, a case where you can be able to diagnose what problem is there remotely. These are some of the things the guys in the solar are doing where you can be able to have a system but you don't need to go there physically. You can be able to monitor the through uh, remotely. I think Kijito is in a very good space to influence policy change, even including things like, can we put more energy into our local research? Why should I import a whole uh, windmill from Italy or from Germany? Why can't I produce it in Kenya? How am I going to get the youth employed if at all I keep importing things and just take them there to do um, uh, put the bolts and nuts on it. Government policies have to grow uh, over time and develop over time and they have to be dynamic. And I think obviously there has been, um, we have been slow to recognize the space that should be occupied and the contribution that can be made by small scale uh, off grid power providers. Not just for wind or, you know, the whole thing of off grid and mini grid projects, whether they be hydro or solar or wind. So it's becoming more and more that the, the communities that are off the grid, we, we, we thank God for what uh, our president is doing in expanding the grid of Kenya. But by 2030, there's still going to be an awful lot of places in Kenya which are not on the grid. And so for non grid supplies, but even where the grid is, wind. Even small-scale wind can, can even implement the, 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 the use of the grid. So yes, I do believe that if we can get the electricity general uh, version of Kijito working, we have a part to play in that overall power supply of Kenya, not using oil-based products. Mike's Kijito wind power legacy is not a story of failure, however. He has found new advocates in Julian Gooda and Vittoria Pietelli, owners of an organization called Bridging Positions, who are now seeking to connect him with new partners in renewable energy to help push Mike's stalled projects to completion. Currently, Kijito does not have a product to uh, win to power. So the next step would be, how can that be engineered? How can that be developed? And uh, that would basically be an update from what Kijito is producing today um, for the future and um, I would say Mike and the workshop team yeah they would need support in updating this uh, their windmills so they need engineering support also investment support so what what's necessary from my point of view uh, so first I would say engineering support to really develop this wind um, to power windmill also in a way that yeah Basically, the energy that's generated um, is enough to make it economically valuable and stable. What we need now is, is technology and, and capital. We have the test machine in our workshop where I have mechanically enabled my, my windmill to turn a generator at 500 RPM, which is what it needs when the rotor is only turning at 30 RPM. That's the mechanical side of it, because I am a, a Bush mechanical engineer. As I said, my degree is in agriculture, not engineering, so I'm not even an engineer. Uh, but I've re I have a, a, a accumulated mechanical skills. But now, to take that generator and enable it to pump water or provide lights or charge batteries is beyond my technical abilities, and at the moment, beyond my financial abilities. Um, I'm 80 years of age. My family has said, Dad, you, you need to slow down a bit. 
and try and find someone else that will partner with you that can take this different technology, which I believe can really help people out in remote areas where they need their TVs, they need to be able to charge their phones, they need to be able to light up their houses at night so the kids can do their homework safely and, and hopefully. And I believe that if we can get the technical backup and the financial backup, I believe this concept can change the whole uh, productivity of, of small wind systems in Kenya. What I can say about Kijito is that the idea, the work that has been done thus far needs to be supported, needs to be supported. And um, I, would, I, would, I would say that whoever is out there looking to support uh, projects and initiatives that are people driven, that work towards community, you know, because I think Kijito for me is an example of a co the type of a community project that can be replicated. Um, by many com communities uh, around the country and around the African continent. And therefore making sure that this succeeds, therefore it will, so that it can be showcased to other people is very, very important. We really thought of uh, connecting Mike Harris and Kijito to the Inno Energy students, uh, especially the Entech students that went through a program called Open Space Studio. So why we thought of that? Um, uh, as bridging position is seven years that we're working uh, with uh, Inno Energy, and particularly we develop co-develop a program that is uh, complementary to the master programs uh, that the, the students are going. So they are learning in the master the business and technology of uh, wind, solar, uh, all the renewable um, energy possible. I'm an engineer from Spain. And um, at the moment, I'm studying a double master degree. Uh, this program is called Entech, um, and it's organized by Inno Energy. Uh, basically, uh, Entech is about energy technologies, as its name says. But my main interest is renewable energies. So, so renewable energy technologies would be my my main focus at the moment. But I think at this moment, when Mike is is growing. Um, older and, and things are changing so much, I, I believe uh, he could really use some help of, of some international students like me, um, where, where he could like get some fresh ideas and, and uh, use some skills that we have acquired just because we're, we're studying at the moment, uh, etc. But I think it is also very crucial to engage the, the African students. I think they're the the most important part of this because they, they can understand better the problems of the communities and, 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 and they can also help other students from outside of Africa to understand what, what is going on better. We as a university will be very willing um, to see how we can um, transfer, technology transfer what Kijito has been doing and with our engineering school coming up, are we able to transfer that knowledge into Strathmore? Um, are we able to bring that knowledge that over the years has been built in Kijito into what the new students in Strathmore would be looking into. Our students in Strathmore, are they able to offer solutions to Kijito, for example? Are we able to work with them to see if they can find uh, solutions to the work that Kijito has been doing? The community projects that Kijito has been doing, can we engage our Strathmore students to just work with the community and see ownership issues, for example? So I think with uh, the collaborations that uh, Mike Harris is making, trying to make, uh, and handing over the button to the younger people to come up with better systems, I think that's the way to go. Uh, you can't just wake up one day and say change A, B, C, D. But if you have people continuously looking at different aspects of the system, then it's uh, easy to go on technologically. Despite a lack of research funding, Mike lives and breathes wind power. In his quest to truly harness the full potential of wind power, Mike has developed a concept of using a dense rotor to generate electricity. This is the same rotor as that of a multi-bladed rotor of a windmill, which is usually said to be of high solidity due to the fact that a large proportion of the swept area is solid with blades. High solidity means that the windmill will run at a very low speed and create high torque in the process. This 
is a significant development because small-scale windmills could be dependable energy sources and produce socio-economically valuable energy to power home appliances and thereby decreasing the electricity cost. So let's go up and see how it actually works up there. Okay, so here we have an electric motor geared down. So we're turning this, this is the rotor, this is the same as the rotor of the windmill here, okay? So this would have the blades on it normally. So I've simulated, using that electric motor, I've simulated this turning at 30 revolutions per minute, which is what it would do in the wind. So now, coming back here, we've had this special made gearbox, which is one to five. So when you put one revolution in, you get five revolutions out of this special gearbox here. And then on the back here, we have this large pulley, turning a much smaller pulley, which is one to three. So putting those two things together, we get one to 15. So that's how, with this rotor turning, as it were, in the wind at, at uh, 30 revolutions per minute, that generator down there is going at 450, which is what it requires for its peak performance. So that's how we've enabled a very slow turning rotor to turn a generator at the RPM that it requires to be efficient, which in this case is 450 revolutions per minute. One of the aspects that I put into this design of the prototype that we've already seen is that this can be retrofitted onto an existing machine. We don't need to go back to a customer that bought a machine 20 years ago and say, look, you've got to throw that machine and buy a new windmill that generates electricity. No. In that whole concept that we've developed on that prototype, we have engineered it so it can be retrofitted onto an exact existing machine. So I'm happy to see the kind of developments and recognition that Kijito has received and that it is coming at a time when I think there's greater awareness and in my belief need for alternative sources of energy, both big and small, in this particular case wind. And I hope that uh, Kijito will serve as an example that uh, there are many things we can do that help us as citizens of Kenya, but more importantly, global citizens, humanity, uh, to advance ourselves, to enjoy our lives and our lifestyles while protecting um, what nature has granted us. Achieving success sometimes requires us to look back as we move forward. Mike Harris' dreams and aspirations for Kijito Wind Power Limited has been greatly influenced by his rich past, which he narrates with ease. As I drive into the farm, especially now we've got this new amazing super highway that uh, President Kibaki and Prime Minister Raila gave us, a six and eight lane highway from Thika to Nairobi. I wonder what it was like for my granddad when he first arrived here. In 1904. I know that when the family first arrived on this farm where we're entering right now, they had to walk. They had to walk from Nairobi, 50 kilometers to, to get here. There was hardly even a track. So the whole family arrived. My father, who was aged four at the time, uh, he, he was carried all the way from Nairobi here on foot. And um, just going through our security barrier here, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Now, as we come into the farm, the first thing that uh, people will see is our airstrip, which is where I operated for nearly 50 years with my Bush aircraft, five Yankee Alpha Oscar Golf. We're just driving along the airstrip now. And just imagine, I can, when I was flying, I could take off from this airstrip here and go to northern Kenya, right on the Sudan, Sudan border in about three hours. Just imagine what it was like in those days when you had to walk or go with a donkey cart. And then gradually things developed. And now we're just crossing the dam that my father built in 1933. So let, let's just have a look at this. This is our, our lovely water storage dam that... Uh, my dad built in 1943. Uh, when he came back from the war, he was part of the war effort uh, in what was then Abyssinia, which is now Ethiopia. Uh, and when uh, the Italians uh, surrendered uh, and that theater of war ended, he was able to come, his regiment was brought back to Nairobi. So he was able to get out to the farm a little bit. And obviously he realized that whatever we were growing, coffee or now avocados, we needed water for irrigation. 
There's no way that you can commercially farm in Africa without irrigation. So my dad built this dam in 1943, and in those days we didn't have tractors. Uh, so this dam was built by hand, by people and, and oxen using ox scoops. It was, a, it was a huge, and it must have taken him, I think, uh, nearly two years to complete. But it served us as a storage facility for our, our irrigation ever since. I came back from university. Um, I met a lovely girl in university called Pauline. I married her in the chapel uh, at Cambridge uh, after I graduated. Uh, when I came back to Kenya uh, in 1961, uh, in those days there was national service and I was enrolled in the Kenya Regiment. Um, and uh, that was interesting because it was the first multiracial intake for the regiment. Up until then the regiment had been purely for, for, for Europeans and that was a very exciting time as we, because we decided to stay in Kenya, come what may, we'd, we, we'd taken that decision. And it was so great to see the three races of Kenya working together in incredibly arduous situations. And so for eight years I had the privilege of, of working with my father here on the farm learning from him, learning from his experience. And then he died in, in 1970. So now, as we come up the hill here, we come up to the family homestead. Uh, the house in front of us was built by my dad for my mum in 1930. And then in the middle of the, of, the, of the emergency, when Kenya was going through some tremendous conflicts, uh, my dis father decided to build a, a stone house. And I think that showed an, an incredible amount of faith that we were not going to go anywhere as a family. We had decided to stay and later on that was confirmed when um, Prime Minister Jomo Kenyatta, you know, he was Prime Minister for a while before he became President, addressed all the white farmers up at Nakuru in October 1963. And he said, uh, if you white farmers want to stay and help us develop this country, you are very welcome. As we come towards the end of our little tour down memory lane, I just want to thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for, for, the, for, for us having the privilege to share a little bit of our, of our, of our story. I think it's a, quite an exciting story uh, from all those early beginnings. I first met Mike Harris uh, in the men's gathering in 2017 or 16, I don't remember. And um, that was uh, a very nice uh, and beautiful encounter. But really more I learned about him in 2017, November it was, um, at a breakfast at the Metiger Club where he was just sitting opposite the table and I really liked and um, wanted to know more about this um, person there on the other side of the table. So by the end of the breakfast, I just shouted across the table, Mike, um, would you mind if I invite myself to your farm? And that was um, the beginning of a very beautiful and impressive uh, friendship, I would call it. And um, yeah, he walked us over his farm. He showed us the office of, uh, of Kijito. He showed us the workshop um, in the office. Uh, he has hanging this map of Kenya and surrounding countries with those uh, pins. And each pin, I think it's about 300 pins, and each of those pins um, represents one of the windmills Kijito has put up. And um, yeah, learning about him, learning about his passion, how he came to get into the windmill business what was what made this big difference for me and uh, which made me appreciate and love um, Mike even more. After toiling away for many years, and investing unquantifiable resources to develop a dense rotor that could generate electricity, Mike Harris has received some startling news that could have major implications on the future of Kijito wind power. The timing is simply terrible. Friends, sometimes in life you, you have a plan, you have a dream, and you think that dream is going to accomplish something. And then as you go a bit further and you talk with a few people and get some advice, you find that the dream may not quite work as you'd first thought. So, as we mentioned earlier on, I did feel that by using our dense rotor to generate electricity in low wind speeds, we could in increase the services that we at Kijita could offer people out in the desert. 
I just had this dream that we could uh, go together with solar and perhaps increase the, the people's ability to have electricity in their houses, in their schools, in their hospitals and in their dispensaries or whatever. But while we've been filming this documentary, thanks to a friend of Julian's, Jean-Louis, and also to some of the original engineers that worked with us in Kijitra in the 80s, what we have, I think we have discovered, that the cost of our windmill cannot justify the amount of electricity that it could generate. The, the scheme I have definitely would work. We could use that dense rotor to generate electricity. But what has become apparent in these last few weeks is that economically, we couldn't generate enough power to justify the cost of an expensive, rather heavy metal machine compared with the cost of solar panels. The lack of attention to questions of economic viability for Mike's technically and sound promising invention is simply a fact that cannot be ignored. So what does the future hold for Kijito Wind Power Company? So, what we're going to have to, again, concentrate on, because I've always believed that our basic technology could work, and we've proved that of nearly 500 machines. And as we've had other people saying already on this documentary, one of the crucial aspects is to get the community more and more involved in the provision of their services that are going to increase their, their value of their lives, the, 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 the um, uh, services that they have access to in terms of, of especially clean water. So I think we really need to now get back to try and see how we can make our windmills work economically and practically in some of these installations. I think we really have to go back to now work on providing the skills that the community needs to service their machine. We have some machines in work, working in Kenya, I've been working for 25 years and they just need a bit of grease and 25 years down the road they are still pumping water. So we've got to try and develop those skills. I sincerely believe that a properly maintained Kijita windmill can last 40-50 years. Now, how many solar panels can last that sort of time? I don't think so. I don't know what the shelf life, or at least the operational life, of a solar panel in the, the desert of Turkana here in Kenya it will be. 10 or 15 years, perhaps? I don't know. That issue about having water uh, using uh, uh, alternative energy is, is a very big issue. But you see, if you do solar panels, then solar panels, people want to steal them. Uh, a windmill you can't just carry away. So I think we, we want to go windmill and uh, it also negates the issue of somebody having to put their hands in their pocket and, and buy diesel. We had um, a group came to us from down in, uh, uh, down in, in near Kibwezi on, 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 on the road to Mombasa. A, a group came to see us a couple of weeks ago and they said, we've looked at solar uh, but we want to talk to you about your Kijita windmills because we know that we can put those up in a remote area and they won't be stolen and so we know we can put it up there, it can be, it doesn't have to have a, a fence around it, it doesn't have to have people guarding it 24 hours and so we've looked at solar but we think in our situation we would prefer to have something that, that, that is strong and that can stand by itself uh, uh, and, and people will not interfere with it. So that just again reinforced the, the, the possibilities that we have. And I think uh, the first thing is that it is, no one really wants to break down a windmill and sell parts. It's not very economic. With a diesel generator people, you leave it in the bush and somebody will want to carry your engine away. With this, we don't have as much trouble uh, securing it. Secondly, due to its low maintenance, you can use it in an area where uh, your economic return is not that great. Even if you're doing a conservation project, it's not going to eat into your funds that much. Yes, we've been involved for the last 40 years on this thing, but uh, th there's always other aspects of doing things. It could be that, with, as Alicia said, you may be able to come up with some things that could reduce the cost. We did have a, a suggestion uh, coming from Holland the other day that there was a prospect of trying to make our blades not out of steel but out of some uh, uh, readily available material here in Kenya so that we could actually make uh, blades out of, out of non-ferrous material. That, that, that would probably reduce the cost and also could, uh, wouldn't have to import so much steel to, to make the blades. Windmills aside, 
Mike is a man of many talents. When he is not actively thinking about Kijito's future, he dedicates his time and energy to farming, which is in fact what he was trained to do many years ago at Cambridge. Hi Kevin. Hello sir. How's it going? Going on well. Okay. Yeah. When do you think you finish this block? Maybe in two days. Time. Two days time. Yeah. Okay. Well done. Just to explain what's going on here, pruning is so essential for avocados. What Kevin is doing here, he's opening up the tops of the trees to stop too much shade here in the middle. If the, the trees are very prone to overgrow. They overgrow, they shade themselves, they shade the neighbours and that starts reducing your production. So Kevin is opening it up so we can get a bit of sunshine in here, open up the tree, also open it up for your tractors to, to come through. So that's what he's doing, essential opening up some of the branches that are overhanging the gap here in between. Okay Kevin, thanks. Raps, let's go. Raps, raps. Having been in this business for nearly 40 years as a family and having often to subsidize it from the outputs of the farm, which of course have put um, quite a lot of pressure on the farm. I've also had to sell parts of the farm in the, in the past to keep funding to Kijito to keep it uh, viable and to keep the guys paid, okay? Where I have been so blessed with, with our employees that things have been tough. There are times when we have not been able to pay the wages on time and they have stuck with us. And I think a lot of that is because they know my heart. There are times when things have been tough. I've stood in that workshop with my entire, the, 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 the farm workers and the engineering workers and I tell them, guys, this is, this is how it's at. This is, I'm not changing my principles, but right now business is bad and therefore I can't pay your wages on time and I ask you to forgive me and I'm doing my best. Mike's love for Kenya and his dedicated service to her people cannot be questioned. Even at his age, Mike has not slowed down and he continues to find better ways of transforming more lives. We as a family count it an incredible privilege to have been able to live on this piece of real estate where we are sitting today for 115 years and six generations. We count that as a real privilege and we thank God for that. But Kenya is such an incredible country and that's why I've, I've traveled quite a lot but I've never wanted to go anywhere else. I've, I've, uh, even through good times and bad times, Kenya uh, is my home. And it has given us such opportunities for those of us Kenyans that actually want to get up and do something. Kenyan gives us incredible opportunities. I've had the privilege of being a bush pilot for 50 years to fly all over East Africa in a small plane. What, what a privilege that was. I, had, I was able to work in police headquarters as a superintendent in reserve for 11 years and, and contribute uh, in that, that area. I was invited onto the President's Advisory Council, Mr. Kibaki and Prime Minister Rylas, where, where we used to meet with the Cabinet every three months. What, what a privilege that was. And then I was asked by Prime Minister Ryla um, to, to join in the team to, to work on police reforms when he and Kibaki were involved with trying to reform the police back in 2009. Mike Anaomba hii ifaulu na isiwe na shida za kufunga funga. Cha pili upande wa polisi na upande ya serikali wengi wanamwamini. Kwa maana hii kazi wamefanya na wameiona. Kwa hivyo wanaona kweli ni mtu wa muaminifu kwenye kazi yake. Uh, Mike Harris has been a friend of mine for a very long time and uh, we have we have fellowshiped together. We have done very many things together over the years and I have observed the way he has very um, uh, determinedly and consistently and tenaciously and in fact I would say that uh, if I was to describe Mike Harris with one word is tenacious, tenacity. Um, he has run his farm uh, down in Kiambu uh, very well but he has over the years tried to do different things um, with a view to seeing what more could he do for society and for the people around him, for the communities around him 
with, with, with what has God has given and gotten him and his family. You know, and so therefore, Kijito for me, I view it in that particular light that this is something that he realized um, was a passion for him, but was a passion that would be able to help communities around him and the country. Mike Harris, uh, from my personal view and knowing him personally, um, is a man with a lot of integrity. He's very straightforward, um, and what I like about him most is that he's a not, he does not stand aside and let things happen. He does what he can to save a situation. Uh, and I think, you know, his proactiveness, even in coming up with windmills in, in Kenya, is something that we should be very grateful about because it's saved a lot of situations in, in areas that would not have water. Um, so uh, my appreciation to him. Um, Kijito is not very far from Nairobi. Uh, so my first visit to Kijito, um, which is the only visit I've done to Kijito actually, um, was a pleasant surprise that somebody has put so much energy and effort in trying to solve problems that we have in our local setting. And it is not a sung story, it's a quiet story, which is very interesting. It's a story that is hidden, it's a hidden treasure. Um, and this is, resonates very well with the Strathmore story because Strathmore is about little people doing big things, yeah, in their own little ways. Yeah? What I would wish for Kijito and especially Mike Harris uh, legacy, I would see Kijito has the community co-creative uh, hub, energy hub in Kenya, in which, uh, yeah, all of the different stakeholders like community, university, you know, that, like Stratmore University, but also other universities and different um, stakeholders, uh, possible financial partners that are coming there to see and progress what is need for each community in the sense of energy power. And of course, um, in how would good look like, there would be someone uh, who has the same passion as Mike Harris had so far um, and who likes to carry on the legacy and do good for Kenya, for East Africa, for Africa. And, um, really make a difference um, as Kijito. I think I'd like to say a real vote of thanks to Julian and Vittoria. I met Julian in, at a men's gathering last year. He came by here, spent a few hours with us here on the farm. I took him very briefly around the workshop. And we've taken so many people around this workshop. I joke that if I had $10 for every person that had come through this workshop and said what a great job we as a family had done, we'd have paid off all the research for Kijito. That's a joke, of course. But he just came and, and he didn't say much, he just said great job. And then suddenly I discover, Mike, we would like to capture this and I would like to support to make this possible. And, and that, that is just fantastic. Julian and Victoria, bless you. Thanks for, 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 for doing that because this was not something that just happened. You came up with this. Mike is also neither in doubt about the role his family has played so far, nor the kind of legacy he would like to leave behind when all is said and done. If anything, his relationship with the creator of the wind is his biggest motivation. So I just want to emphasize that this has been a family project right from the beginning. I, I've been fortunate to have the lead role, but without the help of uh, especially the, the kids, Tracy there, th this was, we did a lot of fishing up in Lake Turkana in those years. And in fact, Tracy there, the, the, the fish she caught was 102 pounds and she only weighed 90 pounds at the time. So the fish she caught was actually bigger th than her. And then Brendan also did well. And then Sarah, when she was working in the Maasai Mara, she pioneered the, 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 the fishing of tourists flying from the Mara to catch Nile perch in Lake Victoria when she was working in the Kenyan industry. So it's been, it's, it's been very encouraging to me as the father and now the grandfather and now the great-grandfather to know that I've always had the support of, of, of my family in what we're trying to do. It's been tough, there are times when it's been very tough, but the, the, the support has always been there and I'm very grateful for that. I hope my family will remember me as a, a, a person who stuck to his principles from beginning to end, even when the, when the going got tough. But in the, midst of this, in the midst of it, I was a loving father. I was a loving husband. 
Um, I was a loving grandfather. So, and that I kept an open relationship with my children, even though generations, you know, I've now, I'm now a great grandfather, so I've now got great grandchildren. My Harris uh, will be remembered by many, probably as the man who brought the water. And uh, for me, uh, I remember him as, as an adventurous man because he likes, whenever he comes to the ranch to do any work, he comes himself and he, uh, he likes camping out in the bush alone underneath a tree and he loves the nature. So, uh, you know, I remember the, the man with many stories who likes nature and who brings water. Friends, as we come to the end of this documentary, I have to confess that I'm, I'm completely overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed by all that's gone into producing this documentary, Julian and Vittoria, their commitment, and to Emmanuel and Anthony and the film crew. They've been such a fantastic pleasure to work with. But friends, there's an awful lot of other people that I just need to thank, because if, they weren't, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here. First of all, my granddad, Alan Charles, left South Africa in 1904 with his wife Olivia. If he hadn't come here, I wouldn't have been born in Kenya. I don't know where I'd been. Then my, my mum and dad, fantastic. They went through the war years. They went through the real complicated and sometimes difficult times that led up to independence. Uh, fantastic. They, they stuck with it. And they really just committed themselves to our farm here uh, and to this country of Kenya. And then when independence came, my dad and I decided to take out citizenship, to uh, not tear up, but to abandon our British passports and to take out this very new brown passport of this new country called Kenya. But friends, there's an awful lot of other people that have helped us, that made it just so possible for us to continue and to survive. The first thing we have to, we have to thank uh, our first general manager, Andrew Challoner, who worked with us for 16 years. Unfortunately, he's not with us any longer. And then there was a whole group of people that came from churches and others to help us. There was Steve Wilson, the original missionary engineer, who was seconded by his mission group here in Kenya and worked with us at his expense for the first 18 months. Steve was so crucial in getting us uh, off the ground with his technical expertise. And then there was uh, uh, Paul Dawson and his team, Sandy Pollock and the others from the UK, which were part of the British aid program. They put in about 250,000 pounds of British taxpayers' money to, to give us the technical background, which I, as an agricultural student from Cambridge, not an engineering student, did not have. Uh, and then there was um, Simon Batchelor, again. He came from a church in the UK and worked here for us for three years at his own expense and was, was very instrumental in our original uh, work in those first few years. And then the group at Old Pegeta. And then, of course, there, there's my immediate family. Uh, my wife, Pauline, Tracy and her husband, Julian, <coughs> Sarah, uh, Brendan, who we took over under other tragic circumstances when he was 16, who committed the first seven years of his working life to us. Fantastic, without the support of, of my immediate family. Uh, we would not have been able to accomplish what we've done. And as we've shared, it's been at quite a huge cost. But I'm very grateful to all of them that have played such a crucial part in making Kijito the machine that, that it, it has already been and which I believe can still continue to be uh, a blessing to Kenya. And then last of all, of course, I want to thank God for what he has done in, in keeping me alive and, and preserving me and being with us. I'm 80 years of age and still fit, and I'm very grateful for, for that. So there's an awful lot of people that have made this whole project possible, and I'm very grateful to each and every one of them, and I thank God for each and every one of them. Thank you. The kind of Mike's servant leadership does not always get rewarded. But he has demonstrated that what conventional knowledge may think is possible needn't be. And a better future for communities living in hardship areas can not only be imagined but also made a reality. What I would like to say to, to our employees and those that have supported us who may be watching this documentary is thanks. We couldn't have done it without you. 
no way. So thanks for your support. It's really appreciated. Things have been tough, but you've stood with us. And thank you, and God bless each and every one of you.